All right, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you evening. for good evening. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for joining us. My name is Terry Q. I'm the Director of Programs and Partnerships at Poets and Writers. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this reading featuring the current fiction writers in Get the Word Out, a publicity incubator for early career authors. Tonight, we celebrate the 10 brilliant writers selected to participate in this program and their published and forthcoming novels and story collections from which they will be reading from tonight. A little bit about uh, Get the Word Out. Um, so this program was launched in 2022. Uh, it was conceived to deepen poets and writers longstanding work of addressing the practical aspects of publishing. It's kind of what we do. Um, and Get the Word Out provides publicity mentorship and industry connections through guest speakers to early career poets and fiction writers who are under contract for first or second book. Over a three month period, applicants who are selected to participate in this program work with an experienced book publicist. And this year we had the pleasure of having Maisie Lim work with our writers, work with them to learn, map out and execute publicity strategies to maximize the exposure of their forthcoming titles, reach readers and create a platform that will propel their literary careers. The program aims to support writers who might not otherwise have access to in-depth publicity support and to help develop strong literary voices nationwide. Since the program began two years ago, 30 writers from 15 states and Puerto Rico, and with books coming out from 26 small and independent presses, including university presses, have been selected to participate. Get the Word Out is, is a unique program. I, I don't think there are many others or any others like it out there. Um, and what makes this program really special, in my opinion, I um, mean, I've witnessed this uh, the past three cohorts, including this one, is the community building and the display of care that happens with each cohort. I guess it's what happens when a group of writers come together to prepare for probably the most vulnerable part of the publishing process, kind of what happens. Um, and our publicity mentor, mentors are really essential in making this community building happen. Over the last 12 weeks, this cohort has been mentored by Maisie Lin, who has so graciously and expertly guided this cohort of writers to not only ideate, problem solve and plan, but also deal with the upcoming, or deal with vulnerabilities and insecurities um, and leaving this group feeling more confident and comfortable, especially as debut authors are getting ready to embark on this next step in their publication journey. It's now my pleasure to introduce Maisie Lin. Born and raised in Malaysia, Maisie is a writer and freelance publicist living in New York. During her time at Riverhead Books, she has worked on all kinds of book campaigns, helping launch the careers of debut authors and continuing to expand the readership of prize-winning authors, including Hernan Diaz, James McBride, Masha Gessen, Patricia Lockwood, Claire V. Watkins, just to name a few. In 2021, she made the Publishers Weekly star honoree list for her creative out-of-box publicity ideas, including a partnership with the New York City Bakery to print a short story, short story by Edgar Herrett on their cake wrappers and a curated open air pop-up reading series around the city. She was previously an executive assistant at Pan America. Currently, Maisie is at work on her first novel and moonlighting as a communications consultant for MPAC, a center for experimental media and performing arts, and Center Lit, a literary nonprofit consultancy agency started by Katie Freeman. It's now my pleasure to welcome Maisie Lin, and I'll turn it over to you, Maisie. Thanks, Terry. Um, first off, a huge round of virtual applause to Terry, who built this really successful program from the ground up. We are now in the second iteration of the Fiction Incubator, and thanks to his vision and hard work, there will be more in the future. Um, he's gathered with us, you know, every week, listening to us talk about our publicity vows and you know things that have nothing to do with his life probably. So we're very, very grateful to him among other things. Um, this is a really bittersweet moment for me because I'm happy that we're gathered here 
to celebrate these 10 awesome authors and their books. But I'm also sad because as Terry said, we've spent 12 weeks together um, with these lovely human beings, two hours a week since Thanksgiving. I've seen them more than I've seen my own friends. It's true. And I'm really sad that it's coming to an end. Um, I think the thing that the main thing that we've sort of circled around, circled around in the past 12 weeks is that the art of writing a book and the commerce of publishing a book can be very different. Uh, and they both come together during this tumultuous publicity process. So we ask questions like, what does it mean when you've written a book that you think is for everyone and now your book is going into the hands of actual readers and you have no control over how they'll, over how they'll react to your book? or you know, how to talk about your book once it's going out into the world in a way that's compelling to these potential readers, but still true to what the book means to you, the author. Um, and of course, our favorite topic in publishing, social media. Do you need to have a platform? How do you do it in a way that feels authentic and not like you're a car salesman? How to not get too addicted to social media? Um, more importantly, I think it's we talked a lot about how do you do publicity in a way that is sustainable and nourishing so that you can continue to write many, many, many more books and have a long, successful career ahead. So if you are authors in the audience right now and you're intrigued and you have a debut novel or a short story collection or a second collection, possibly um, look out for the 2025 application that's coming that's opening in the summer. Um, so these authors that you will hear from in a bit, um, they are published by small presses. They've done two things. The first is that they've written books that are fresh, original, brilliant, poignant, funny, heartwarming, and I'm really excited for you to hear more about them in a bit. The second thing is they've worked really, really hard to get their books noticed. Um, some of them have had to design their own covers. They've had to set up their own book tours. They've had to write to media themselves. Um, they've done a lot of work. They're, very, they're a very impressive, hardworking, talented bunch. So I hope that everyone in the audience um, will support them. If you are in the media, if you do interviews, please ask them for a galley, review their book, include their books in any, you know, can, many like social media content you're, you're putting up. Um, if you are somehow an educator, uh, assign them to your course, invite them to speak at your schools. If you're in charge of book clubs, select their books for your book club. If you're a librarian, order their book. Um, you know, if you're a bookseller, definitely stock their books in the bookstores. Um, and all these, and if you're just, if you just want to support, you can pre-order their books, you can share it on social media. I will, after I stop talking, I will drop my email in the chat. And if you have any questions about any of these authors, you can get in touch with me and I will make sure that your request gets to the right people. Um, and that's it for me. I think I'll turn it back to Thierry. Thanks, Macy. Um... It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, the first reader of this evening. Christina Cook was born in Jamaica and is now a Canadian citizen who lives and writes in New York City. Her debut novel, Bratopsy, was published on January 23rd by Catapult Books. When Christina's not reading or writing, she can usually be found riling up strangers on the internet by hating on all things Twilight. Please welcome Christina Cook. And apologies to anyone who is a Twilight fan, except not. Let's argue on the internet. It's super fun. Um, so first, thank you to um, Thierry and Maisie. This has been an absolutely delightful and illuminating, um, however many weeks time is a construct. Um, and I think it's funny how you think that you're going to be rid of us now that the incubator is over. You know, I look forward to our continued chats, our continued kind of like um, ribbing of one another and just being able to, you know, further this communi community by, you know, uplifting and growing with future iterations, as well as connecting with the cohorts who have gone before. Um, it's been a real blessing and, and a joy to be part of this program. So thank you. Um, so as Thierry mentioned, my debut novel is called Brought Up, Brought Up See. Um, uh, it is essentially a sister, a sister story um, that centers on a young woman named Akua 
whose um, older brother, I mean, whose younger brother has just passed. And so she's decided to return to the island of her birth, Jamaica, to reconnect with her estranged older sister, Tamika. Um, as you can probably tell from that intro, it is an incredibly beautiful but difficult reunion that takes us through grief, sexuality, family, nostalgia, belonging, and migration. Um, the section that I'm going to read to you today is um, from when Akua first lands on the island and she has her first kind of like lived experience of like being back in Jamaica, like in her actual body versus returning to Jamaica only in, in her mind. Um, so without further ado, to keep us rolling along, this is Thoughtopsy. <clears throat> Stepping in the muted daylight beyond the sliding doors, I cough then clutch my chest. The sudden change from air, condi air conditioning to humid wind makes me wheeze. Coughing still, I walk to the curb, the crumbling concrete giving way to potholed road. Next to me is a woman in a teal church dress yelling at a man tying suitcases to a car roof with pieces of twine. Across the street is a patty stand with a long, long line, and next to it are men in mesh shirts leaning against a wire fence, blowing smoke through their noses as they puff and puff. And there are children selling Pepsi and coconut water from beat up cool coolers and porters pushing two full trolleys behind white families, their skin garish against all the black. And next to me, a child with black arms and black hair and down the sidewalk black and behind me black. And I look and look as I pull my suitcase closer, sneezing against car exhaust, billowing and patties baking and peanuts roasting in a pit hitched to a bike parked behind Cove Corollas packed with eight, 10 passengers and tour buses boasting AC destined for resorts behind policemen wielding batons in wide arcs of move along, move, move along as so many people, black, black, the sight of us filling me till drowning. My God, I'm home. And that's it. I'm gone, drowning beneath memories of my of my childhood rippling high in hot crests. Chirp of chewy frogs floating sonorous, each piercing chirrup rising on the wane of the last. I'm in my childhood home. I am nine years old. Eyes shut. I pressed my hands against the slick pane of my bedroom window to feel the cool, damp night. Right here, the banana trees, the orange trees, the pumpkin patch that just wouldn't bear. Over there, the neighbor's house, the football fields, the hill leading down to Spanish town rising up in a smooth green curve. A dog barked. A door opened. A car engine sputtered then stopped. Up here, the clothesline, the water pump, the pipe to the underground well that sometimes doubled as a, as a slide. Behind there, the rose bushes, the old satellite dish, the gaping pit from that house that caught fire, the earth dark and red like a crusted wound. Fingers spread, eyes open. A lizard crawled across the glass, its white belly swelling red, then nothing, nothing, thick black nothing. A car started and sirens wailed and the frogs kept chirping, chirping. Is that Nancy Meckett? That's what Miss Lou said. The woman on TV with the big, big smile and long brown dress and red plaid scarf tied round her head like a, like a crown. It was my mother's favorite show. We used to watch it together, just her and me, every Sunday after after church. A Nancy trick poor Breda told to jump in a wild pot of boiling water. And ever since, why? Long high whine, curving up, ending shrill. 
like a scream. And the trees and the earth and the pigs is snout and the reason why cows go moo. Is a Nancy Meckett, so, so she said. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, our next, our second reader is Lisa Allaire, who lives in Tucson, Arizona. Their debut novel, Modern Moss, is out in July 2024 with Tin House Books. Thanks, Meiji. So I'm joining you all tonight from Tucson, but Smother Moss takes place in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Set in the 1980s, it's about two sisters with a pretty prickly relationship. One of them, Angie, is obsessed with zombies and the strange creatures she draws on a series of tarot-like cards. The older sister, Sheila, is obsessed with a girl in her class and weighed down by an invisible rope around her neck. There's a murderer on the loose, an invisible boy with ambiguous intentions, and the mountain they live on has dark secrets of its own. In the scene that I'm going to read, the younger sister Angie is interacting with the cards that she draws. Angie deals the dustman onto the quilt next to the bird thing with the black scribbles in its guts and twisted forks for legs. The broken back turtle next to the twins with too many teeth. She says their names aloud when she lays them down. Saying the names is power, like knowing a secret. Some of the creatures stay for weeks after they pour out of her marker onto a card content to doze in the pack among their fellows. But others seem to kick the moment they arrive, demanding release. Angie shuffles the cards through her fingers until she can feel one that is heavier, slower, more real. She stops. Yes, this one. On the card, the tangle of rabbits are knotted together. Rabbits stand on rabbits, half devoured by other rabbits. Rabbit legs thrusting in all directions. A foot into a face, into a stomach, into a tail. The rabbit made of rabbit crouches in the briars, hiding from its enemies. The briars snare its hind legs and tangle around its neck. Thorns tear its tender ears. Angie gets up and trails through the house feeling the tangled rabbits in her hand, listening for their homing signal. In the kitchen, she pulls out a chair and climbs onto the table and flips the card into the shade of the light that hangs above them every night while she and her mother and the old woman and her sister Sheila eat. Angie is just putting her foot back down on the chair when Sheila's voice cracks out of the darkness. What do you think you're doing? Angie's foot slips off the edge and the chair topples, bringing her crashing to the floor. Turn my back on you for one minute and you break something. Sheila's voice is flat, accusing. It's not broken. Angie writes the chair and shoves it under the table before Sheila can notice that one of the legs is wobbly. I'm not hurting anyone. Angie stoops to pick up the other cards that have spilled in the fall. As Sheila watches her sister crawl across the scarred wooden floor, the rope around her neck cinches tight. She feels like someone has stuffed a sock down her throat. She wants out of here, somewhere there is more air, where she can breathe. But where is she going to go? Out there is only the mountain, as familiar as the planks Angie scrabbles across, the battered table with its mismatched chairs, the chip plates drying beside the sink. As familiar as the finger marks on the walls, smooth and shiny from generations of hands touching the same places, year after year after year. Angie collects the last card and gets to her feet. In the dim light, shadows shift across Angie's cheeks, uncovering the imprint of their family. Sheila can see their mother Bonnie's face in there, and old Dina's too. 
the long line of women stretching endlessly back into the fog of time and ahead, forward into the future. Feeling Sheila's scrutiny, Angie rolls her shoulder. What, she demands. Nothing. Sheila turns away and climbs the stairs to their attic room, dragging the rope behind her. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Our next reader is Kathia Alexander. Kathia is an author, playwright. Sorry. Kathia is an author, playwright, storyteller, and teaching artist. Growing up in the South in the 1960s, the civil rights movement greatly impacted her life and continues to impact her writing. Her novel in verse, Keep a Living, is the story of an ordinary Negro family living through those extraordinary times. Please welcome Kathia Alexander. Sorry about that. Thank you. Keep a living. Chapter one. The heat flowed down the hall and danced off the walls of my bedroom. Mama in the kitchen. She got the oven on for the biscuits she make it. The sound she make when she fluffed the dough with her hands is what wake, wake me up. Whoop, 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 the dough say. Like kid is talking to mama, telling her if she got the consistency right. I don't wake up to the sound of my mama making biscuits every morning, every day for all of my life. Every day. Not just in the middle of winter, but every day. No matter how hot the weather already is. This is summer in Arkansas. My head hurting so bad, I can't even sit up. Today, the 4th of July, so even though it's scorched and hot, my mama done already started cooking a pot of turnip greens. I can tell by the smell. It ain't even seven o'clock yet, but it's already hot as hell in our house. Mama also is cooking our breakfast. She make biscuits and gravy, pork chops and bacon, smothered potatoes with onions, and she is boiling some more potatoes for the potato salad that she making for later on. Today is also mama's birthday. I have got her a present. I paid for it with the money that I make from cutting Theta, running to the store, getting her Kent cigarettes and short Cokes. It ain't much cause cutting Theta don't really pay all that well. My head is pounding and I feel sick to my stomach. Every breath that I take fill my lungs up with hot air. I try to lift my head so I can get out of the bed, but arrows of pain shoot through all my scalp and my neck. The air coming from my fan feel real damp and real warm. I hear Sissy in the living room. She is mopping the floor. She like to do her work in the morning in the cool of the day. But ain't no such a thing, really, with mama cooking the way that she do every morning. I do not understand how she can be in that kitchen. I hear her pull the pan from out of the oven, the biscuit dough finally ready. I can hear the radio in her bedroom. It sounds scratchy with static. Sweet Willie Wine, the DJ, talking about the children's crusade. That's a bunch of colored children down to Birmingham, Alabama. And the things that they did just changed everything. My brother Quentin was a DJ on the same radio station before he left Little Rock and moved to Jackson, Mississippi. Now he a DJ in Jackson for WOKJ, although he moved around a lot following all of the civil rights demonstrations and reporting on the radio all the things that go on. I try to move my head again, but it feel like some daggers is stabbing me in my eyes so bad that I can't see. I know I need to get out of bed and go help my mama, but all I really want to do is to go back to sleep. I hear mama take the biscuits from out of the oven. 
She started to hum and as she take them into the dining room and sit them on the hot pad that she put on the table. Then my mama start to moan the old Dr. Watts hymn. She is going to start to sing in a minute. That is what she always do. I can tell what kind of mood she going to be in by the song that she sang. This morning she chose. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, whither shall I go? Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Essinam Bidiaco, a Ghanaian American writer from Detroit who now lives in Southern California. Her novel, Blood on the Brain, is out in September with Red Hen Press. Thank you. Um, before I start, I just want to thank Thierry and Maisie and my fellow cohort members. Um, I can usually be pretty stoic about things and how I feel about things, but this experience has been um, just so meaningful to me, and I'm really grateful for it and grateful for all of you. Um, all right, my book is a, is a coming-of-age story about a Ghanaian-American um, woman who's kind of having a crisis of identity as she deals with um, family issues, the reappearance of her um, absentee father, a head injury, all kinds of things. And she kind of just rushes right into more drama whenever she can. Um, all right, I'm gonna start from the beginning. I linger at the information desk, running my fingers along the faux wood panel, sliding them up to the plastic placard on which the Department of Housing engraved his name, Daniel Kobla, the same last name as one of my cousins on my mom's side. I fleetingly remember the story my mom told me once about a Ghanaian guy and girl who met in the States, fell in love, married, and moved back to Ghana, only to discover from some great aunt who kept tra track of the family tree that they were actually related. But I'm not marrying Daniel just asking him out. And besides, the guy and girl of that old wives' tale always stay together. After all, whether he's a distant cousin or a stranger, a husband is the same kind of burden, or so my mom jokes. As usual, I'm thinking of my mom when I shouldn't. Hi, Pete, I say to the middle-aged white guy at the desk. Pete often greets Daniel with an awkward fist bump and a what up, dog, not noticing Daniel's discomfort. Hey, looking for Daniel, he says. He's out in the field. A freshman got locked out of her room. Dan had to bring her a key because she was in nothing but a towel. The field is a smattering of do dormitories on a compact, compact yet architecturally alluring college campus in New York City. Two years ago, I finished undergrad here. Six years ago, I started a work-study job in the library and didn't expect that after graduation, I'd still be working in the same department. Nor did I expect that I'd be asking out Daniel Kobla, housing department staff level two. Once a week for three months, since I started working the late shift at the library on Sundays, I've been meeting him at his desk and talking to him during the last half hour of his shift, after which he walks me halfway to my apartment before saying goodnight. He's my lifeboat. I know that sounds intense, like I'm getting carried away over some guy, but I'm not. Akosua, and there he is, just as if I've conjured him with my mind. How are you? He's always this formal, like I'm speaking to one of my aunties at a Ghanaian get together. I'm fine, and you? Well, he says, I don't really enjoy running to unlock doors for careless students, he says jovially. I never locked myself out of my room when I was a student. Here he goes, this is what he does. Always the same conversation. 
First, he says how much he doesn't enjoy whatever housing related task he's wrapped up in. And then he discusses how he's never been so irresponsible as to engage in ex careless co ed behavior, get locked out of his room, set a fire while merely boiling water, clog a toilet with tampons and paper towels, and so forth. Then follows a rapid downward spiral into reminiscing about our days as undergrads here and how special we are now that we're un now that we're graduate students and employees. We're not special. We're pathetic, stagnant, reliving the same moments again and again. But I don't want to burst his lovely chocolate skinned, well muscled, bright futured bubble. He is a catch. And for once, I'm ready to do what it takes to reel one in. Daniel, I say, I've been meaning to ask you. Yes. Um, we really only see each other every Sunday here, but I think we're getting to know each other pretty well, so yes. I was wondering if I could ask you, yes. Ugh. I slam my open palms down on the surface of his desk, of the desk, upsetting his nameplate. I give a smile. Sorry, I just you're trying to you're making it hard for me to talk to you right now. Oh, I always find it very easy for us to talk. Well, me too, which is why I'm trying to ask you, if you don't mind, I've been waiting all week to talk to you myself. Daniel takes hold of my hand over the desk. A, f at a first, in three months of this Sunday night ritual, he has never held my hand. I've spoken to my cousin about you, Kwesi Koblan. He's a doctoral student, not here, but in Brooklyn. Why, what exactly were you telling him about little old me? Is the question I ask is a error, a grave mistake. In an attempt to sound like some kind of sex kitten, I come off as wheedling and self-conscious. Just naming some of the Ghanaian girls around, he was very interested to hear your name. Daniel grins as he says it. Mercy Akosua Agbe. It is not so common to find an Agbe in New York City. In fact, aside from you, I've never met an Agbe in all my life. Now his voice cracks into a cackle, for he has made a little joke. My surname, Agbe, means life in Ewe, our language and ethnic group. Don't you get it? I've never met an Agbe in my life. I get it, I get it. But while I'm laughing at his joke, he says, so anyway, my cousin Kwesi knows an Agbe, Kofi Agbe, your father. How do you know that particular Kofi Agbe is my father, I ask, but I know right away that it must be. After all, like Daniel said, it is not so common to find an Agbe in New York City. Because Kwesi asked if he has a daughter by your name, and he does, I know that after so many years of his absence, you're probably interested in seeing him, I can get his phone number for you. His words have opened a door in my brain, triggered a flood of thoughts and emotions do th that do not fit the situation. I'm asking a guy out on a date. I'm not asking to hear about my father. I don't wanna have to think about my father during a moment like this. If I can't control the way he moves in and out of my life, at least I deserve to have control over when I think of him, right? I pull my hand from Daniel's, wipe it on my jeans as discreetly as I can. I don't talk to my father. I haven't in nearly 20 years. So tell your cousin, no, thank you. But my cousin says your father is a very nice man. I smile, lean across the desk and talk directly into his ear. I don't care about my father right now. I care about you going out with me on a date. He squeezes my hands, his face falls. He plasters on a pleasant, avuncular expression. Oh, Akosua, thank you, really. I'm flattered, but I'm horribly busy. Maybe next semester? Thank you. Thank you, Essie. Up next, 
Marissa Higgins is the author of A Good Happy Girl, Out with Catapult this April. Marissa is joining us from Puerto Rico. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to thank all of you guys for being here and um, just how grateful I am for having the opportunity to get to know all of my really talented and smart peers and just thank everyone for reading tonight. It's really cool to finally hear each other. Uh, my book is called A Good Happy Girl. It is out on April 2nd. Um, it is definitely very weird and I'm just going to read the first like page or two. It doesn't really need any context. Um, thank you for listening. I ran characteristically late to meet Catherine and Katrina and so I took a cab, though I hated sharing confined spaces with men. Those were the days before you could request a woman driver. The cab ride did not take long as I had suggested a cafe only a mile from where I lived. During our introductory phone call, a formality to make sure none of us was a scammer, I told the women about my narrow one bedroom apartment and its excellent natural light. It's small, I'd said, turning myself in a circle naked with bloated belly out and pretty, surveying the space as though to measure my own honesty and accuracy, less to be certain I was not misleading these women whose lives I might change, and more to confirm for myself that reality was as I described it. My place isn't much, I continued, but if you two ever wake up here, it gets the warmest light. Oh, Catherine had replied, we certainly plan to check it out. I felt in her silence Katrina agreed. We planned to meet for non-alcoholic drinks at a 24-hour diner to start, a boundary I established as a means of reassuring myself I was not entirely careless with my life. I was unsettled in the months following my parents' incarceration. I had no siblings then and hardly a friend I hadn't hurt. I turned to the apps for sex with greater frequency, telling women who pressed for more that I was having a hard time and could not commit, careful to remind them that they were radiant, full of life, and that my opaque behavior was not their fault. The women who did not press gave me a sense of both relief and betrayal. The day I actually met Catherine and Katrina, I did some of what I had done on the day I canceled. I scrubbed grime from my blinds with a toothbrush. I hustled to the pharmacy and bought disinfectant wipes for the counter and the toilet rim. I loaded up on decongestants to save my mind. I brushed my teeth, which in bad spells, I did a few nights a week. I believed worthy women would detect the mire under my skin. My grime, a game I played with myself, which women would I clean up for? Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Our next reader is Parul Kapoor. Parul is a writer based in Atlanta, Georgia, and her debut novel, Inside the Mirror, is due out next Friday, March 1st, with the University of Nebraska, Nebraska Press. Welcome, Parul Kapoor. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the reading. And I wanted to start also by really thanking uh, Theory and Maisie so much for this amazing program that we've had for the last three months. It, it feels like it's followed me right up into um, publication, which basically it has. And it's hard to imagine how I would have handled all the different things that one is supposed to do um, around the publication of a book without this program. It's really hard to imagine how so most writers have to just uh, navigate on their own. So thank you so much. And also, um, I really admire my amazing cohort. I hope we can 
continue to stay in touch because it's hard to think of disbanding um, after today. So my debut novel is um, Inside the Mirror. And um, as Theory said, it's being published um, next Friday is the publication date. It is a novel I worked on for many years. And it's set in 1950s Bombay, India, uh, which the city now known as Mumbai. Inside the Mirror is about twin sisters, Jaya and Kamlesh, who aspire to become artists, a painter and a Bharatanatyam dancer in a society that denies women the freedom to shape their own lives. Everything they do in pursuit of their arts as a vocation and not a hobby comes at the expense of betraying a loving family and violating the prohibitions of a shaming society. It's an exploration of female creativity and identity making in a country that is remaking its own identity in the devastating aftermath of British rule. The novel grew out of my interest in the arts, especially painting and my experience as a young reporter in Bombay um, soon after I graduated from college. So I'm going to read from the, from the beginning, from chapter one, and it's part of part one, which is called The Witnesses and Their Dreams. Inside the gunny sacks were the makings of a man. There were two bags roughly dividing the bones for the upper and lower halves of the body. And Jaya had not wanted them inside the bedroom. But her father said they should not be stored on the balcony during the monsoons where she'd kept them last month because they might start to smell in a heavy rain. The servant boy had climbed a stool and placed the sacks on top of the wardrobe at her father's instruction. Her mother grimacing as the thin boy raised the bundles overhead. Jaya had been told to ask the servant to retrieve the sacks for her whenever she was ready to work in the afternoons. Instead, she had moved the rootless bones once again. She'd removed a pile of household wreckage from the corner between the wardrobe and the wall, a broken towel rack, loose shelves, boxes of childhood belongings, and pushed the bone sacks into the space where she could easily reach them. Today, she had pulled out both bags, not only the one containing the bones of the upper body, which she had to mark up. She hesitated before removing the rib cage and placing it on an old sheet spread over the dhari on the floor. She glanced behind her. The door was shut. No one liked to see her laying the bones on the bedroom floor and taking her red chalk to draw a line where a muscle originated and marking in blue chalk where the muscle inserted. Now she took out the brownish basin of the pelvis, searched for the long shaft of the thigh and found a fully formed foot, all the knotty bones threaded together. These were new bones to her. She had not dared to assemble them like this before. The first couple of times she'd set out to do her assignment, she had asked Kamlesh to stay in the room on the pretext of holding open Gray's anatomy for her. Searching inside the sacks, inside the sacks was frightening. All sorts of forms coming into her hands, rough protrusions and smooth cavities. She'd have to pull out a number of bones until she found the ones for the arm that they were dissecting in college. Her twin had frowned and asked to leave, looking so distraught that Jaya realized she would have to do her work in privacy. If their grandmother happened to be in her alcove at the back of the bedroom, which the three of them shared, Jaya would ask her to shift to another room and Babaji would rise from the bed, taking with her the many newspapers she read religiously. Babaji found it indecent for a person to handle human remains. From her writing table, Jaya fetched her pen and ink bottle and tore a sheet from a tablet of drawing paper. She tacked it to a small plank she used as an easel. She sat on the floor, leaned against Kamlesh's curio cabinet and considered the skull with its clenched set of teeth and hollow eyes, the winged hole of the rib cage, the rod of a femur and beneath a gap of white sheet, the fan-like foot. The morgue prepared the bones from the bodies of the unclaimed dead found in the roads and railway stations. 
each first year medical student was partnered with a fresh skeleton. Here were the pieces of a man. Who had he been? Jaya drew the rib cage with a slower hand, the trunk of the sternum and looping branches of ribs needed close attention to be given form as a whole with lines and shading. A splotch of ink spread on the half made foot, the toes sharp as pincers. A thought came to her. How do you become someone? She wrote the words like a banner in a fluttering script and capped the pen, lifting the board from her lap. For a moment, she let herself drift, closing her eyes as she tried to feel some connection to the man. Moving on to the bed sheet, she slipped a few feet away from the fragmented figure she had laid out. Aligning her body parallel to his, she lay down, wondering if she could assess the man's height, discern something about him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so next joining us from Bennington uh, is Bruna Dantas Lobato. She's the author of Blue Light Hours published by Grove Atlantic in October. She won a National Book Award uh, for her translation last year. Hi, thank you, Macy, for that uh, introduction. Hi, uh, thank you for that introduction. And thank you to everyone, this cohort, I mean, just to echo what everyone has said, this group has been incredible. Um, and I'm also grateful to Terry for meeting with us every week and putting this together. Um, it's just so incredible to see everyone making good art and showing up every week for their community. I also hope we'll be in touch. Um, my book uh, is called Blue Light Hours. And yes, I absolutely printed out the cover. Uh, there it is. I don't have galleys yet. So I just like tote this around, I suppose, to show it to everyone. Um, and it's coming out in October. And I'll be reading um, a passage where a mother and daughter talk over Skype. The book is about this a Brazilian woman's first year at an American college and the relationship she forges with her mother over video calls. So here's uh, one of them. I called her again when I thought she'd be awake and her face glowed in the dark, lit up by nothing but the computer screen. Were you asleep? The light was giving me a headache, she said, and took her hand to her brow. Everything gave her migraines in those days. She felt dizzy, her ears rang, her eyes twitched. To protect herself, she had to live in a world of blandness, often in silence, often in the dark, warm gauze over her eyes. It occurred to me that she'd love the milk carton, which is what she calls the house that she lives in on campus, uh, in the campus, the carpeted halls and the snow muffling every sound, the dining hall food, the constant darkness, nighttime always spilling into mornings. I told her this and she said, can you imagine if the moment I got there and ate your food and slept on your bed and walked around in your clothes, I was suddenly cured? I told her about my walk to the soccer field. She smiled and said, so it turns out you do listen to what I say and get out there. I do, I do. Just don't go on these walks when it's dark out, she said. Have you heard about the Filipino student who got murdered somewhere in New York last week? Not too far from you. I laughed happy that she was ba back to being so unmistakably herself. When winter break was almost over, my mother emailed me to say that she'd received the package I'd sent her for Christmas, a few weeks too late when I'd already forgotten about it. On Skype, she waited with the box on her lap so we could open it together, her hands and my address. I can't believe this came all the way from America, she said. She turned the box to the screen to show me the customs label I'd filled out. Look, I'm touching your handwriting, she said. Might as well be touching your hand. She cut the tape open with the kitchen shears and found the card I'd written for her, a brown dog running down a snowy hill. Read it to me, I said. Querida mãe, she said. Feliz Natal. But then she couldn't make out what the rest of it said. 
Your handwriting has changed, she said. I can barely recognize it. I don't write in cursive anymore, I said. Not since I was a kid. That's it, she said. It's very grown up now. I no longer see my little girl in it. Show it to me and I'll read it. She placed the open card in front of the camera and I tried to make sense of what I'd written, but all I saw was a blur, neat lines of blur. She went through the rest of the contents of the box, a tiny bottle of maple syrup, a little bag of peppermint candy, a blue shawl. She put the computer on the coffee table, then stood up and draped the shawl over her shoulders, swaying from side to side. It's like a hug, she said, a cocoon. She sat back down and curled up on the couch, covering the length of her body with it, the shawl as a blanket, all the way up to her chin. Will you talk me to sleep? I nodded, but then I couldn't think of anything to say. I thought maybe I could read her a story instead, something soothing, nothing like the news. I looked around my room for a book in Portuguese, something we could both understand, and then I realized there was nothing. All the books around me were in English, and every flyer, magazine, brochure, even my own diaries. Read in English then, she said. I don't mind. I just want to hear your voice. She closed her eyes and waited, stroking the tassels at the edge of the shawl. I grabbed one of the Victorian novels I'd been studying and opened it to a random page. I told her all it said about orphans and fortunes and fate. I read for what felt like an hour. 28 pages worth of story. Sometimes she nodded until she didn't, her lids shut, her head heavy over one shoulder. And then what? Was I supposed to hang up, hang up on her, on my own mother? I muted my mic and kept watch for most of the night, her occasional stirs, her face glowing in the dark, her hair over her eyes, the restlessness of her sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Our next reader is Jesse Marshall. Jesse is based on the island of Hawaii and her debut novel, Women in Peril, is due April 2nd with Bloomsbury. Please welcome Jesse Marshall. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Maisie. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, Thanks for all the hype and love that you're sending through the chat as well. We really appreciate it. Um, so yes, my book is a short story collection called Women in Peril. And if you do happen to get a copy, I hope you will take a picture of yourself like this with the book. That would be great. Um, and also, I wanted to let everybody know I just set my book launch. The book is out April 2nd but the book launch is gonna be at PNT Knitwear in the Lower East Side of New York City on May 1st. So if you're in the area, I hope you can make it. And right now I'm just gonna read a little bit from the title story and it's told in a series of blurts, which are a form of social media kind of like tweets. Blurt one. Awake session one. What is it like to wake up in deep space? Ugh, not glamorous. After four months in sleep state, I crawled out bent with crusty eyes and flat hair. Good thing there are zero mirrors on ship. Fun fact, 90% of us signed a petition to demand mirrors, but the scientists knew the journey would ruin our bodies and said, no mirrors, you'll be too ugly. Sorry. Blurt two. Can't remember what I am supposed to do. Dr. Norton talked about stretching, stretching and jogging. Oh, can barely keep eyes open. Feel sad because according to scientific projections, I'm now hideous and also brain is swollen. Blurt three. This is my first awake sesh and TBH, it's kind of a letdown. The Sleeping Beauties and I are lucky to be here for sure, but let's get real. All the stuff you thought would be cool on ship is not cool. 
like the hall of anti-gravity is very barfy and the observation deck is super boring because there aren't any comets and or planets out the window. I mean, obviously there must be comets and or planets scattered among the tiny white pinpricks, but they're not like whizzing by with flaming tails and visible rings or oceans. Blurt four. TBH, I'm feeling very lonely and sad. The scientists warned that in our first wakes, we'd be mourning and transitioning. They said writing these blurts might help. On Earth, blurts are public, but here they're more like a diary because it takes so many years for a blurt to reach home. Also very helpful is the button I can press to fill the air with smelly vapor and a sense of well-being. But if I press the button too much, I won't go through mourning and transitioning to reach acceptance. Blurt five. Dr. Norton was my favorite scientist at the intergalactic training facility. He said passengers must evolve from defiant earth brain to a sera sera space brain. That is the goal. K sera sera space brain will help me become a productive member of planet B and planet B is for best. Blurt six. The scientist said telling stories is good for the brain. They help our neurons make connections, one, two, three, first, next, and finally. But sometimes I want to go back and ask them, is it still good for your brain if the stories don't make sense? I don't know why our stories have to make sense when the world doesn't. Blurt seven. Here's a story. One, we ignored the signs and let a third of the insects and half of the animals and most of the humans die in a single year. Two. They tested my lady parts to see if they worked. Three, I went on a spaceship. Three, I lived on a spaceship. Three, I stayed on a spaceship for 200 years. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, up next, Lynn Sansbury has lived and worked all over the US and the world, but came of age in the Peace Corps in Guatemala in the Vietnam era. She currently lives in Seattle. Not All Dead Together, her novel and stories is due out from Chin Music Press in October. This is the usual thing where I have to unmute myself. Um, and what I tell people is I'm probably better muted um, I don't have a proper cover. I, the best I can do is show you this. It's probably backward. Um, but uh, one of the best things about being so close to last is that you just take all of those thank yous and appreciations and thoughts about ourselves as a group. Um, and you get to just, okay, multiply those by about 100. And, and that's, I think, the way we feel. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, Macy. Um, Not All Dead Together chronicles an unusual friendship that grows between two young women and their families, one gringo, one Guatemalan, exploring the meaning of family and of heroism in, in dire times. In the present scene, which is in the first story, but um, uh, which is in the closest to the present time, but it, the beginning of the loop back through the past. Miguel, the middle brother in the Guatemalan family, who is now an aging community clinic doc on the edges of Guatemala City, finishing up one evening alone, is forced at gunpoint to tend to a wounded drug thug and guesses that one of the masked gunmen is a former medical student of his. Miguel nodded to Slim. Slide that light over here, would you? The thumb and thumb side of the hand were gone. The index finger was a dark purple tube hanging on by a shred of skin and muscle. The skin was peppered with black spots. Even with a tourniquet, the ragged end of the radial artery leaked pulselets into the wound. He clamped the torn artery, loosed the tourniquet. Somewhere deep in the shattered flesh, the other end of the vascular arc of the palm began to leak, a good sign. He mopped up the new blood, packed a towel around the hand, filled a clean syringe with saline, flooded the wound, dabbed it dry with gauze, tied off the end of the radial artery with cat gut, all the while thinking, that's a self-inflicted wound. 
a classic way desperate boys get themselves out of the battle line. Does the pistolero know? Does Slim know? Do either of them know that I would know? The injured boy lay on the table, stuporous in his post-adrenaline backwash, plus the kick in of whatever he was using. He watched Miguel's movements as if the arm and hand belonged to someone else, dark eyes swinging in their sockets like the beads in the disc eyes of a child's stuffed toy. Miguel irrigated again. The wounds were paler now, uh, wound edges, waterlogged but clean. The oozing had stopped. The remaining fingertips were dusky, but not purple like the index finger. They hadn't pinked up with the release of the tourniquet. They weren't any darker. The pistolero said, can you fix it? Miguel didn't answer. He stood staring down the hand. He could amputate what was left of the hand that he could do, prevent infection, make the boy a decent stump, and by the way, get rid of those telltale powder burns. Done it enough in his army days. The boy was young, he'd survive. He'd heal. But the longer Miguel stared down at the boy's hands, the more sure he, he was that he didn't know what to do. I know what I can do, but I don't know what could be done. And the only one who can answer my questions is me. Smells pushed in, blood, wet clothes, the rank bodies of young males, iodine, isopropyl alcohol. He and old Marcella, the custodian, were gonna die. She wasn't dead already. And this boy was going to lose his hand and maybe die because he was stupid and scared and probably evil as well. Mostly, though, he was unlucky. He'd been born here, into this place and time, a tale of 30 years of war and 15 more brigandry. Other boys, just like him, lived in L.A. and Houston and Miami and Baltimore. But for those boys, there were surgeons, brilliant angry and exhausted experts in microvascular repair, living on caffeine and adrenaline with all the resources money can buy, who wander down the hall to trauma OR4 at two in the morning and save their hands. And then there was Slim and all the other best hopes that swirl down unseen gutters with the rain and the ash. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Our final reader this evening is Lena Valencia. Lena is a writer based in Brooklyn, New York. Her debut collection, Mystery Lights, is due out with Tin House Books on August 6th. Please welcome Lena. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, I want to apologize in advance. My downstairs neighbors just started banging something uh, on their ceiling. So you might hear some of that. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, this has been such a wonderful program. Um, I just want to um, extend my thanks to uh, to poets and writers, to Terry and to Maisie and to everyone in the cohort. It's been so fantastic to hear uh, everyone's work after talking about it for so many months. And this has just been such a joy. Um, so as Terry said, um, I'm the author of Mystery Lights. Um, it is a short story collection that is forthcoming from Tin House Books in August. Um, it is about uh, women and girls um, uh, confronting uh, dangers, familiar and fantastic. Um, many of the stories are set in the Southwest. Um, and uh, the story I'm going to read from tonight is called Troglazine. Um, it is about uh, Max, who is a 10-year-old girl who goes missing in a cave while on vacation in Arizona with her family. Um, she's eventually rescued uh, after about a week and a half. Um, it's narrated by her 13-year-old sister, Holly, who realizes that something is off about Max uh, after she's been found. Um, so this is from Troglazine. When Holly had first pulled her mother aside to tell her that Max was missing, her mother had told her the cave was no place for goofing off. They'd paid good money for this tour. She demanded that Holly go get her sister and tell her that since the girls had been so horrible all day, fighting over Holly's silly sweatshirt, and now this, there would be no ice cream, no souvenirs from the gift shop on the way out. Mom, Holly said in a trembling whisper, I'm serious. 
Something wild lit her mother's eyes. She called out Max's name, running deeper into the cave. The tour guide stopped her lecture on cave geology and followed her mother, lips pressed to her walkie-talkie, shouting code. Her father went next, chasing after their bouncing headlamp beams. Holly stayed put, the confused voices of the tour group around her echoing off the walls. No one knew how Max had gotten so far away from the group. She was found all those days later, a dozen miles from where she'd run off, in, part of the, in a part of the cave that was closed even to park staff. The hypothesis was that she'd floated down the underground stream. It was a miracle she had survived. How was what Holly wanted to know. But her parents had warned her not to ask Max questions about the cave, that she'd tell them in her own time. Holly had read up on Forrester's caverns during those days alone in the vacation rental. She knew about how the cave had been discovered by uranium miners, that the bats that lived there were called troglazines because they left the cave to feed, that the cave fish had no eyes and were called troglobites since they lived only in the cave and never left. There were weirder things about the cave too, conspiracy theories, UFO sightings near Mount Vista, a two-headed rabbit skeleton found at the entrance, rumors of a 30-foot-long snake seen slithering through the Hall of Echoes. The websites that made these claims looked like they'd been built in the 90s, filled with capital letters and long-winded screeds. Most of them focused on creatures called mud men, humans who'd gotten lost in the underground maze and become mutants who lived on raw flesh. It was the uranium-tinged water that was responsible for the mutation, apparently. It was nonsense, Holly knew. But what if it wasn't? Then what? Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Wow. Thank you all. Wow, what a reading. That was... That was spectacular. I've only read excerpts from all of your books and I finally got to hear, it's always better live and <laughs> kind of in person, I guess. Uh, but that was a wonderful reading. I can't wait to get my hands on your books. Um, I wanna end with a series of thank yous. So please bear with me. I'm gonna ramble off some thank yous here, but um, I wanna thank you all audience members for for showing up tonight. Um, it's always just a treat to uh, be able to share work with an audience. So thank you for being here and for supporting these writers in this way. Um, a special thanks, I think I did notice quite a few uh, fiction writers from our inaugural cohort here tonight. Uh, so I think, yeah, thank you, Jin Sun, Mark, Anita, Shen, and I think I saw you too, Brenda. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I also want to thank uh, the guest speakers who showed up uh, to share their knowledge and wisdom with the cohort. Um, Norris Ellis Demick from Riverhead Books, Spencer Ruckdy of Third Place Books in Seattle, Emily Firetog at Lit Hub, Miwa Messer of the Port Over Podcast, and authors Hernan Diaz and Tyreek White. I see you, Tyreek. Thanks for being here. Um, also, huge, huge thanks to Day Beautiful and Bookshop for their continued support um, in making this program visible. And, and last but not least, a huge special thanks to the Lennon and Louise Riggio um, and Macmillan Publishers for their generous contributions that help support this program. Maisie, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you truly are a star. <laughs> Um, I don't know what comes after a rising star. You're, you're somewhere up there and deep in the hemisphere. Um, I appreciate all of your work and your attention to detail and coaching this group um, and making their confidence and their stars rise as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Um, and last, last but not least, um, a huge congrats and thank you to this wonderful cohort. Um, thank you for your brilliant performances tonight. Thank you for showing up, for trusting this program, for trusting poets and writers, Maisie, myself, your fellow writers, and yourselves. 
Um, I wish you nothing but the best of luck with these books and the ones that will come after. Please go out and support these writers, buy their books, support their, their presses, small and indie presses. Uh, we'll drop a link in the chat to Bookshop where you can go and pre-order, purchase their books. Um, and the last an announcement I'd like to make, um, I think Maisie may have mentioned this already, but applications for our next Get the Word Out Fiction cohort will open up this summer. Um, if you aren't already a subscriber to our newsletter and want to kind of stay informed about one that will open and other just work that we do at Poets and Writers, uh, we'll drop a link in the chat to our newsletter as well. So please sign up for that um, to get news announcements about our future cohort. Um, with that said, I want to say again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. That concludes tonight's event. Thank you for being here and have a safe night and a great weekend. Thank you.